Shalom, everybody, and welcome to the Ishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Judea to the world. You're a part of it wherever you are. Shalom, and welcome to Maka Fleischer. Hello. Shalom, and welcome to the show. And, you know, it's a really beautiful day. It's been raining, raining, raining here in Israel for a long time. And suddenly, uh, just yesterday, the sun started popping out, and today is just this beautiful day. And I was just outside right now, Maka, with a CBS crew, CBS News. Right. Uh, you, when you, were, you used to watch CBS when you were sure, a Sure, Dan right? Rather. Yeah, that was a... I think that was Dan Rather, right? I think so. Yep. Yep. That was like a thing in your house? Yeah. Yeah. Who didn't watch... How many channels did you have? I never watched CBS. We had like... At the beginning, you had like five channels. And then I think everyone had like something like 10 or 11 channels. And Dan was in all of our house. I don't know why, but when I was a kid, I never liked CBS. I didn't like it. They had good shows, I think. I think some of their... My mother used... Alea Shalom used to watch some of the CBS um, soap operas. Right, right. And I was just I like, think they had the good soap operas. I never, it, was, it was in New York area. It was Channel 2. I never watched that. I, I just I never liked Maybe it. Maybe it's like in the South it was more popular. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so CBS was here, and I took him to this beautiful grassy knoll here overlooking the town. And, and, yeah, I took him to a grassy knoll. And, and uh, you know, they were asking me questions, uh, and I'm going to play that. Once they play their video, then I'll start. Play, I'll play. I recorded everything. Right. That's um, what you got to do these days. That's right. For sure. You got to do that. Um, one of the things she's and when, when the interview was done and they were doing some more setup shots. Yeah. She goes to me. Do you feel that you're misunderstood? Hmm. I said to her this very interview. I, I said you did a professional job, but like the very interview itself is 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 itself proof that I'm misunderstood. You mean like off record? Like she have to like when yeah. the cameras were off kind of thing. Yeah, they were doing like, like when you guys were just schmoozing at the end. Yeah, she mm-hmm. goes to me and I said to her, "Yeah, of course we're misunderstood. There's a whole smear campaign." Oh, she goes to me. <coughs> this is this was interesting. She goes, "Do you love this place? Do you love living here?" I go, "The word love isn't exactly right. Like when you love something, like oh, I love this car, I love this ice cream. Oh my god, you know? <laughs> it's like it's like I love it. It's like <laughs> I'm like I don't love it like in a sense like I really like it a lot. I mean, I said to her, it's it's an organic." holistic connection that has to do with history dna spirituality you love your kids it's just like the word love does not encompass the feelings that you have right in connection to your children of course you love your children right but it's, you also are enraged at them you're also annoyed by them <clears throat> you're also proud of them you're also lots of stuff of them right right on and off, here and there, up and down. Right. But love, love, like that's not the word that associates you with your children. Right. But 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 I said to her, I said to her honestly, she she happened to be she's a a, a white Australian. She's actually from Tasmania originally. Mm-hmm. Uh, she told me there's a big Jewish history in Tasmania. But in any case, um, uh, and I told her that I had vi- visited Australia. I said to her, I, I didn't want I didn't want to say the word white Australian. I said to her. As most Australians don't understand what it means to mean to have a deep connection, so she goes to me. The Aboriginals do. I go, mm-hmm. yes, that's exactly what I meant. I didn't want to say you're a white right. Australian. Well, she got it. She was smart. She got. Oh, she's she's sharp cookie. So so I said to her, like most people, that's why when I speak to people like that are Indian, Chinese, Persian, uh, native peoples, they understand naturally what it means. You don't love your land. You are part of your land. It is your land. You're not. It's not like a piece of land that you own. It also owns you. You are from it. It is from you. It is you are right. It is with you whether you love it or don't love it. It is right. Your. It's like your soulmate. It's like your connection. Like you. You can't undo it. Nahon. Right. And and even more so that that's what's ironic. Ironically, for Jews, it's actually even more. On the one hand. And less, on the other hand, of a connection that we have to this land. What do I mean by that? Less, we have a connection because we Jews can exist in other places and have existed in other places. From New York to Vienna, we know how to exist in other places. But when we reconnect with our land, with the land of Israel, the land itself is named after our peoplehood. The history here, when you see the mountains where the Book of Ruth took place, right here, and where King David was born and frolicked, um, and the more is that we also have, a, God tells us to be here. God, G-D, tells us to be here. <laughs> right. He, he wrote it down in a note. He wrote it down, but in the, in the Holy Torah book, it's the, it's not, so therefore you're not just like, let's say an Aboriginal in Australia. The will of God is right. that you are supposed to be in this land. 
So that makes it, again, the word love is a little bit like... It was part of the design. Right, it's part of the universal design of the universe, okay? It's the godly wish and will. You know, uh, this is, people laugh. You know, you know what people like that I say? I have a, a Ari Abramowitz says he doesn't like when I sometimes use the word Allah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't love it either, but okay. But he said, but when you say <laughs> Allah wills it, he likes that, okay? Because a lot of times people, like, like I'll get on Twitter, you know, they'll say like, what, what are you doing on the land? Blah, blah. I go, Allah wills it, that we're here. That's it, you know? And, and that's what I mean. I just mean to say like, like the, the greater, so therefore when a white Australian journalist is asking you, like, do you love it? No, she probably didn't mean. No, it like she didn't that. mean it that way at all. She was trying to understand you. I, I really, she was really, she was really fine. Yeah. What I mean is, the word love. I said to her, it's an organic, holistic experience. It's the heavens above. It's the land below. It's the topography. It's the, the look of it. It's the air of it. It's the text of it. You have to be connected textually, and then of course it's the society that's supposed to live on this land. So, what I mean to say is, the Jewish person living in the land of Israel is right it is it is a fundamental correctness in this world and how ironic it is and i want i couldn't say all this it's a hardware not a software right it's a bug not a feature it's a feature not a bug right okay and 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 uh how ironic it is that so much of the world does not understand that so when she says to me do you feel misunderstood i'm like (laughs) sha <laughs> yes. Oi. Excuse me. Uh, it's becoming a little allergic out there. Yeah, yeah. The, the, all, we got a lot of rain. Yeah. After all the weather predictors. That's by the way a little. We're sad. like, that's it, people. Yeah. A Global little- warming. We're gonna be a <laughs> desert pretty soon. And we've gotten a ton of rain after, of course, a huge uh, bulk of soldiers were released back home from Gaza. Then the rain started to really come down. Baruch Hashem. Yeah. Um. And uh, everything is, is nice and green here in the hills of Judea, but right. that is less good news for the sinuses of some Jews. Which, which is a little bit upsetting. Yeah. Because, because if I'm so organic and holistic, then what the heck do I have allergies? I have allergies. Okay, okay. Right. And, that's, and I, I guess that's the gullus leaving us, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right? It's probably have, the food we eat or something. I don't you know. You know, the, all the organic people say that we shouldn't have gotten vaccines and we eat weird food. And I, I don't know. I, I, just, I just think that um, it is sad a little bit that, uh, that we are allergic. I have another sadness in my life, which is I don't really uh, digest wine too well. And I don't, I don't deal with wine very well. And so that's a little sad for me because Yehuda is this region of wine. And I'm like, I just... Yeah, but there were rabbis in the Gemara who didn't digest wine well. Yeah, rabbis in the Gemara, okay? okay. But here I am after 2,000 years back in the land, and I want to... What, you, th- you think you should have evolved? I think I should have revolved, okay? Back... But I'm saying that the rabbis from the Gemara did not digest wine. There was one, there was one rabbi. There was one rabbi who, uh, I don't remember his name, but he said, you know, that it's known about him that he couldn't... He, he was allergic to wine, and he suffered headaches from it. And st- he still drank uh, the four uh, cups. Uh, on the four cups. In any case, on, on Pesach, but um, I have ways to drink wine, but just not a wine connoisseur. I, I can't what, enjoy what, it. Do you need? Do you feel like we should talk about it? It's just a little pain. I I, I sometimes use this platform to uh, you know just talk about stuff. Yeah. To, How does it make you feel? <laughs> makes me feel good. <laughs> I'm alive. You know what? I'm alive, but there are people who have been hurt very badly oh, right now. You shy. So and bad. oh, and that's what how I started my interview with CBS. I said to them like, right now we're talking about this. Jews are being murdered. It's it's bad. Oh, one one more thing, Malka, about CBS. One more thing. She says to me, she goes, so is it your contention that it's always the Arabs' fault for when there's violence? That's a tricky question, right? Because it's like, a good question. It's yeah. the best way I've heard that question asked. Yeah. So I said to so her, what'd you say? I said to her, I said, I said to her, uh, that's that's not a correct way to phrase the question. I said, ha. To her, I said to her, I said, it's it's really not an issue of of who started it. I said that's a very Western approach. Like whose fault is it exactly? I'm like, we have two. Uh, uh, ethnic groups that are contending over this piece of land. We have a land conflict between two ethnic groups. We're in a fight. So sometimes it's this and sometimes it's that. But basically, we have two groups of people fighting a pe- over a piece of land in a tough region. That's that's what's going on. So there's no point in asking who started this case or this case. You know who who's really the uh, the bad guy here. We have a, we have a fight. We believe that they as a group are the bad guys trying to steal away our land. And that this is our land. In any case, and I said to her, look what happened today in Maladmim when, yes. when just now 
uh, a big Commuted. attack happened this morning. <laughs> right, people commuting on their way to work, on their way to school, <clears throat> excuse me, in Jerusalem, mowed down. I saw a picture. There were three terrorists. Two of them were offed. Uh, one of them is not. I like that a lot better than neutralized. They were offed. They're off. They're, yeah, they're, 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 um, they, uh, finished off. Yeah. They're, they're not going to be doing any more harm to anybody in this world. Well, they did their thing already. And they did, they did, uh, I saw a picture of their weapons. One weapon I saw, they had a lot of uh, machine guns, Mm -hmm. multiple machine guns and handguns. I saw that one of the guns had a picture, uh, had a stamp on it. I am I which stands for Israel Military Industries. Mm -hmm. So they either stole that weapon or got it sold to them on the black market. Uh, It's possible even. I don't know what the Palestinian Authority carries. Um, But anyway, Isha, the latest update that I've seen, according to Mata, is that one person was murdered near Malay Dumim, uh, a young person in his 20s. In addition, a young woman pregnant uh, in her 20s was hurt seriously. But miraculously, her uh, baby was not injured, was not hit. Um, but we have to pray with all of our might for this poor woman. I have no idea if the man was her husband, her brother. I don't know if they were in the same car. Um, but it is a catastrophe for these people and for the Jewish people. And we should really pray very, very from the depths of our soul for their full and speedy recovery for all those injured. Because there's additional injured people. I think there were a total of eight people who were hit. <clears throat> Um, and, uh, you know, what do you say that hasn't been said? It's like the, we have a war going on in Gaza. I have this story here. Uh, it was written by the times of Israel, which I I don't usually send you guys to, but I haven't seen anybody, uh, writing about this and I feel like it should be read. I'll just read the first little part. IDF said advancing Gaza city pilot to have unaffiliated locals take over governance. TV report says military met with community leaders in Zaytun neighborhood, wants them to take charge of aid distribution in hopes of establishing alternative to Hamas rule. So if you read through this article, they're like, they basically want to create like what they did over here is like pick a guy like Mahmoud Abbas, go, you are the guy. We're going to prop you up now. We're going to arm you, keep you safe, and you are going to be the alternative to Hamas because Hamas is Hamas and you're not Hamas, right? So we're going to we're going to prop you up and then pull out and let it go. And that should be fine, right? But we've seen this all before. We've seen what the Palestinian Authority has become and the like the ridiculousness of thinking that you're going to like pick a dude from some neighborhood and go, okay, well, you run stuff now because you're so very different than Hamas, right? And you're now going to represent all these people who have no affiliation with the ideology that Hamas represented. And all these Jewish, young Jewish men uh, and women who went to fight in Gaza, and some of them are dead, and some of them have lost limbs, and some of them have lost eyes, and some of them um, are are full of, of pieces of metal. They did all that. So that we can create what we have. Beit Lechem, by the way, right next door is where the terrorists come from. And that is, that is uh, by and large, a Palestinian Authority controlled area. And we're just going to do that in Gaza. That's the answer, right? And it's like we have people who were shot to death on the street uh, on their way to school and work. We have soldiers fighting in Gaza. And here we have this like... I don't know what you call them, leaders? Like, I don't want to call them leaders. What do we call them? The the apparatus, the like, the controllers? Apparatchiks. Like, right. Well, like, what do you call them? Like, and they are busy, like, undoing our progress and making it that more people get shot on their way to Malé to work in Jerusalem in the future. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, we had... um I'm part of a group of women uh, in my town who are fighting to keep Hamas supporters from ever being allowed to work here again in this town because they, you know, uh, Palestinian Authority workers would come. And this is this may sound surprising to you, but in fact, this is a reality all across Judea and Samaria and inside Israel as well. The Palestinian Authority workers, because they're not taxed to death like like in Israel, so they can provide much cheaper labor. 
Anyway, so uh, we're working on on making it so that that can happen. So we had Moshe Faglin um, come to town, and he talked about um, you know the realities of the war and things like that. And and um, I forget what I was going to say, but the point is that he that that he gave the impression that until we can uproot the leadership that we will never uproot the terrorism. And when I talk about leadership, I'm not talking about Arab leadership. I'm talking to my embarrassment and shame about Jewish leadership. Until we uproot a certain element that has been in control, or at least be able to infuse new ideas that come from other swaths of society inside Israel, until we can be part of the discussion in a real way, in a powerful way, then things are not going to change. Um, you, you, you said there um, really one of the psychological reasons that, that these people cannot, cannot continue anymore. They're always looking for somebody else to control the land of Israel. They're always giving it right. away. They're never like, to, we'll do it. Yeah, we're not, they're, never, they're never like a let's take control and do what we're supposed to do in our land. Right. They always they always come to the right, wrong conclusion. They're trying conclusion. to hand it out again, hand it off, hand it out. They're always coming to the wrong conclusion, and and they think they're so smart and they're so smug and they're so stupid. Okay, it's like stop giving away your land to somebody else's control. It's like, can somebody please take my land? Is there anybody around here who can take? They don't want to deal with the uncomfortable questions. Right. right, and the uncomfortable question is, what are you going to do with two million? You're going to do Hamas supporters who are now going to be, you know, it, let's even say that we get rid of every member of the Hamas org LTD. OK, let's say for a second that the the people from Hamas Corp all go away and then you're just left with regular Gazans. W- would you like to take a poll of what their opinions are of Israel and what their what their plans are? Listen, it's very simple. We give residency to people who are pro Israel, who swear allegiance and and loyalty and f- fealty and fidelity mm-hmm. to the to the Jewish state and those who don't want to then right. salam alaikum. In fact, yesterday there was a, all over Twitter there was a story of a man. I think his name is Hamad. I forget his last name. Anyway, he was given he got his Israeli citizen citizenship yesterday from Gaza. Okay, he's a Gaza and he just got Israeli citizenship yesterday. Why? Because during the October seventh, his like he was driving. And his wife was killed and the, the, like the terrorists shot up his car and he did some something or another that ended up saving like 45 Jews. So Israel's like, come on in. Like, clearly you can't live in Gaza. So come on in and you're going to be a citizen. So so it's important to understand that there is room. I wrote about this on Twitter yesterday. There's a misunderstanding of about people like you and me that sometimes people think that we have no tolerance for non-Jews in Israel. Right. That because Israel is a Jewish state, that there can't be anyone who's not Jewish. It's like a threat to, to the you know, Torah ideology. But what I say is that you don't understand. What you don't understand is that we don't have a problem with non-Jews. We have a problem with anyone who wants to attack Jews, whether that is physically or spiritually. Anyone who wants to attack Jewish people and get them to be harmed or to be moved away from who they are and what they are, that is not a person that I have tolerance for. Everyone else is an amazing partner opportunity. Like that person could be a real partner, both in the physical world and in the spiritual world, spiritual world, right? That is a person who is an ally, who is on my team. And we like people on our team. We don't think of ourselves and as our the Torah only... And our Torah tells us that right. these people are welcome. Right. Bottom line is, is that you've got these leaders, these Israeli leaders, who just like, they're always like, <laughs> it reminds me of the story about the guy who, who told me, uh, he says to me, uh, yeah, I moved recently to um, uh, Cleveland. So I go, why did you move to Cleveland? He goes, well, I was... A Jewish li- guy? Yeah, Jewish guy. Okay. I'm like, why did you move to Cleveland? He's like, well, I was living in New York... And it was just so full and it was so expensive. So then I was like, I decided to move to Florida. Mm-hmm. So I looked around in Florida and I just couldn't find any houses and jobs and schools for my kids. And I was just like, mm-hmm. 
And then he's like, so then I like looked up to Hashem and I said to Hashem, where do you want me to go? Wow, and Hashem then I, wanted and, him in Cleveland. Right, and then he's like, Hashem gave me an opportunity in Cleveland. I'm just like, oh my God. Maybe that's what Hashem wanted for him. Yes, yes, maybe. And maybe Hashem also wanted what he says in the Torah, which is come back to your homeland, right? And so so like I, I, I made fun of that, which is like, it's like the guy like walks in the streets of New York. He's like, God, where do you want me? Florida, no, Cleveland, yes, and God bless Cleveland. I know Cleveland. I like Cleveland. The people there are wonderful people. But like, if you're already like looking to God to be like, right. where and am I supposed moving, to go to? You're like doing a major right. life shift. It's just like go to the Holy. And we're talking about an Orthodox Jew, right? So it's the same thing here with where the Jewish people. See, it's actually related. I like this. This could be an article where it's related. Where the Jews are like, who should rule our land? Who should rule? Can we find somebody? Could it be the Saudis, the Egyptians, the international the Americans. community, the Americans? Somebody please take my land and rule this thing and govern this thing. Okay, there's a lot of people. Can you just handle this for me? Because I don't want to do it. Can anybody else take my land? It's just like, it's just like, bro, bro, bro. It's not so complicated. Stop being complicated. It's simple. It's simple. It's your land. Hold on to your land. Okay, there's a population there. If there's an issue there. Handle it. Be, be, right, be a grown up. Be a grown up. That's it. Be, be, be a governor. You know, like gov, like hey governor, like that. <laughs> like be a gov. You know, dot gov. You know, dot gov. Dot. Because dot G- the people D. who make the decisions in this case don't think that we are the legitimate rulers of Gaza. They don't want to be a British Empire who comes in to gov exactly like you talked about. They don't want to be a gov. No, they don't want to gov. They don't want to gov. I, I'm talking, I want to buy a domain, god.gov. What do you think about that? Okay. That's good. Yeah. Go do that right now. You just announced <laughs> it on the show. Hurry up. <laughs> okay, I'm on it. Um, what did I want to say to you, Maka? Listen, we have a lot more stuff on the show today. Uh, first up, I want to thank the good folks that make this show happen, which is you, the loyal friend, loyal connection, loyal listener. Uh, and so thank you, th- thank you so much. And please visit our buymeacoffee.page, buymeacoffee.com forward slash Yishai. That's cool. That's really, really nice of you. Our projects at Kev Ruth Vishai and our other projects are, are pushing forward hard. So please, the Tomb of Ruth Vishai in Hebron. So please help us out uh, by uh, going to hebronfund.org uh, and uh, by uh, caring very much about the Tomb of the Forefathers and Mothers and about beautification. So that's hebronfund.org. Hebron, nothing, nothing like it in the whole world. What a schut, what a merit it is to be there every single day. Um, then I want to thank the good folks at um, High on the Har. They make you high on the Har, right? And the Har is the Temple Mount, and there's nothing like going up on the Temple Mount and getting really spiritually high. Lord, get me higher and higher, as we say, as, as Shlomo Karl Bach saying. Uh, so that's highonthehar.com. I want to thank our, the good friends at uh, prohibitionpickle.co.il. Mm-mm-mm. I am hungry right now, okay? And I would like to go for some stuff. Swallowing back some uh, spittle there, but I'm okay because I'm just hungry. Uh, it's because uh, Ari Abram once has me on a on a uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, intermittent, intermittent fasting, fasting. diet. So there you go. So I'm intermittently fasting, uh, and when I'm done fasting, I like to go to prohibitionpickle.co.il <laughs> and get some yum yums for Shabbos because Shabbos is coming. Shabbos is coming. Thank Hashem. Uh, and kosher cycle tours will tour you around the country beautifully in the land of Israel on a cycle in a kosher style, kosher fashion. And so we bless the good folks at Kosher Cycle Tours. We hope to get on a Kosher Cycle Tour tour ourselves soon. Uh, and speaking of cycles, there's, there's uh, the great cycles of watches. My uh, Adi watch that I wear has come back to me from the from the fixers. The glass has been fixed, and so my beautiful a retro watch guy watch is back, back to, being to a Shabbos watch. Back to Shabbos and special occasions watch uh, and Knesset watch. Uh, so uh, that's retro guy retro guy watch. Dot com really cool stuff and check out their great retro Instagram. watch guy retro watch guy what i say guy watch no 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 retro watch guy okay <laughs> I, i'm telling you it's, gonna... a, it's a it's a watch for retro guys right oh it's but a, it's retro watch guy retro watch guy thank you very much Malka. Yeah. and i'm sure i'm sure you're gonna find it if you google it anyway we have a very intrepid reporter uh, on our staff here his name is ben bresky and this week he's doing something a little bit different which is about the gauchos of uh, Argentina, the story Interesting. of... Interesting. Yeah. What an appropriate... He's such a little brilliant person. He is. He's, he's a brilliant... He's brilliant That's so cool because we had, we had the prime minister, uh, the new president, excuse me, of Argentina here, and he made such What's a, his name? Javier? Javier? Javier Millet. Right. Javier Millet. Good guy. 
crazy Good hair. Guy. Loves He's Israel. He's an amazing guy. He he has already announced that Argentina will move its embassy to Jerusalem. He he went to the hotel. Oh I think we gosh. might have discussed this in the last show. Yeah. But he went to the hotel and there's a video, such a gorgeous little video of him like crying his little heart out <laughs> in front of the God of Israel. And then that same week that he was in Israel, two two Argentinian hostages were abduct- rescued who right. are also who are Israeli and also Argentinian citizens. Yeah, it was- which is really to me like Hashem Mamash looking at him and being like, I'm giving you a gift. Like this is me recognizing you. And Jeremy compelled a great video about that and talked about that very moving. Right. Uh, so Javier Millet, Argentina, Argentina, and Ben Bresky, take it away about the story of the Jewish community of Argentina. This is a moment in Jewish history. This past Shabbat, I attended services at Kihila Latina, a Spanish-speaking community organization in Jerusalem, which hosts Shabbat meals and other events. I never really grew up with Spanish speakers, so for me, it was different, but everyone was warm and inviting, and helped translate. That's where I learned about the Jewish gauchos of Argentina. Argentina has one of the largest Jewish populations in the world and the largest in Latin America. Jewish gauchos were Yiddish-speaking cowboys, horsemen and farmers who once lived and thrived in Argentina. Back in the 1880s, things were not too good for the Jews of Russia. The pogroms and anti-Jewish restrictions prompted many to seek more freedom elsewhere. They left the shtetls of Eastern Europe and the Pale of Settlement in the Russian Empire to seek a new life in rural South America. The first eight Jewish families arrived in Argentina in 1888 to set up agricultural communities. The next year, over 130 Russian Jewish families came, sponsored by the Jewish Colonization Association, founded by Baron Maurice de Hirsch. Born in Germany, Baron Hirsch became a wealthy banker. His grandfather was the first Jewish landowner in Bavaria, during a time when there were many restrictions on Jews owning land or what professions they could have. Baron Hirsch's successful financial career led him to become a philanthropist, and he donated vast sums to help poor and persecuted Jewish communities. The Jewish Colonization Association began as a way to support Jewish farmers in the land of Israel. It also funded communities in the United States and Canada. Today, it still exists as the Jewish Charitable Association and focuses on the development of Israeli peripheral areas in the Galilee and Negev. Baron Hirsch met with another Jewish leader who was also working to resettle persecuted Jewish communities. The not-yet-famous Theodor Herzl would go on to write the book The Jewish State and found the World Zionist Congress. Herzl thought that the Jews should move to the land of Israel, and while Baron Hirsch funded many communities there, he was focusing more on Argentina. Colonia Mauricio was named after Baron Maurice de Hirsch, then came Moises Vice, or Mosesville. The Russian immigrants who founded the community became farmers and built synagogues and community centers. The Kishinev pogrom in Russia prompted more Jews to move there. One of them was Alberto Gershonov, a noted Argentinian writer. His father, Rabbi Gershon ben Avraham Gershonov, was murdered by an Argentinian bandit. Gershonov's most well-known book was Los Gauchos Judíos, published in 1910 and translated into English as The Jewish Gauchos of the Pampas. It was made into a movie in 1975. One of the fictional characters in the book is Favel Duchach, whom he describes as an original-looking man. A hook nose dominated his face, and his long beard was balanced by long locks of hair at the back of his head. He wore the loose gaucho trousers, the bombajas, under his traditional Jewish cassock that was belted in his case. It was a fantastic get-up, but Favau explains the absurdities by stating, I'm a Jewish gaucho. The opening to the book reads as follows. As I greet you, my brothers of the colonies and cities, the Republic is celebrating its greatest festival, the glorious feast of its liberation. The days are clear and the nights are sweet and the praises of national heroes are sung. 
Voices reach toward a sky that is always blue and white, as in the national flag. The meadows are alive with flowers, and the hills are covered with new grass. Do you remember how back in Russia you laid out the ritual table for our Passover's glory? This is a greater Passover. So leave your fields, my brothers, and prepare your tables anew. Cover them with white cloths. Sacrifice your whitest lambs and place the wine and the salt at hand. This is a generous roof that shelters us today, that soothes the ancient pains of our race and covers our wounds with the soft salve of motherly hands. My wandering Jewish brothers, my tortured comrades, now free men, kneeling, let us raise our faces to that friendly sky's light. Let us join the choruses of praise. Let ours be the words of the Song of Songs that begins, Hear this, O ye mortals. Alberto Gershinoff, Buenos Aires, 1910 Later, in the 1940s, when Hitler came to power, Gershinoff became a dedicated Zionist and promoted Jews to move to the land of Israel. Moise Vice was a thriving community. There was a Yiddish theater, Jewish newspapers, and a community of horse-riding Jewish cowboys and families. But as the years went on, the community dwindled. As the years went on, the community dwindled. More and more moved to Israel. The synagogues now still stand, but are mostly empty. And today, the city is known mostly for its museum and cultural center that stand in testament to a community that once was. Today, in Israel, Argentinian Jews have made an important contribution to Israeli society. Groups like Kihila Latina, based in Jerusalem, and Ole, based in Tel Aviv, host a variety of activities for young and old, for all Spanish-speaking Jewish immigrants, and sometimes for English speakers like me. This has been a moment in Jewish history. Thank you to Yishai Fleischer. Thank you to all the listeners, and Shalom. And we're back. Thank you, Ben Bresky, for the story of Argentina, the Jews of Argentina. And God bless uh, the president of Argentina, Javier Millet, <clears throat> for continued success and continued pro-Israel light to the world. Thank you very much. God bless you. Um, Malka, uh, I've been working hard to make my YouTube page uh, more alive. And I got to tell you, uh, YouTube is an amazing platform these days. It really touches a lot of people. And so one of the things that I've been doing is reaction videos. And uh, I did a reaction video to a video that a lot of people didn't see around the world, which is uh, Mark Levin Mm -hmm. on Israel's Channel 14. It's very good. He spoke very well, and I added commentary to it. And so here is my uh, um, reaction video to Mark Levin, the great one, interviewed here on Israeli Channel 14 in English and my comments to it as well. Here we go. Mark Levin is one of America's great, he's called the great one, right? He's one of America's great commentators, an author, columnist, syndicated radio show host, TV show host on Fox. uh, And he was on Israel's Channel 14 in a recent interview, which I think a lot of you didn't see because it was only in Israel. And it's important because he really pushed back on some of the narratives that are out there against Israel today and that are being pushed by the American administration. Here's what he had to say. So what do you think about the pressure that the Biden administration is putting on Israel to end the war? Instead, the Biden administration pushing for a fast international plan to establish a Palestinian state as soon as possible. How should Israel work with the American government under this pressure? Well, first of all, that's absolute insanity. Unless Israel wants to commit suicide, it should never listen to the Biden administration. And you see, he is absolutely the worst president in American history for Americans. And so he's the worst president in American history for Israelis. Let me explain. This two-state solution is a final solution for Israel, especially given what's been taking place. You have an administration, the Biden administration, that is meeting with terrorists. You see him meeting with and talking to the head of Qatar, which has funded Hamas. Qatar is the main funder, along with Iran of Hamas. That is shameful. What do you- okay, so what we're dealing with right now uh, is the issue of allegiances. Where is the allegiance of the Amer- American administration? And it seems that after such an attack that Israel has faced, such an existential danger that Israel has from the south, from the north, from Iran, 
Instead, we're being pushed right now to do the opposite of pushing back these forces, rather to succumb to these forces, right? To give into the jihad by giving them a state that, that the United States is pushing to recognize unilaterally. The Israeli government has had to issue a statement saying, we are not going to accept the Biden administration's push to unilaterally recognize a, a, a God forbid, a Palestine in our ancestral homeland, because that would endanger us. That would be a great win for Hamas. So where is this coming from? Is this our ally? You think Biden should have done differently? Resigned. That would have been a good start right there. Um, Biden is really speeding towards the finish line with this push for a Palestinian state. As I said, there can be a Palestinian state. It's called Jordan. You want a Palestinian state? It's right there. It's called Jordan. You got your Palestinian state. Uh, but the truth is, Biden is... All right, so before before he goes on to the next point, how important is this one, which is there already is a two-state solution. There already is a so-called Palestine, and that is Jordan, right? In, in 1922, Britain cut out a big chunk of what was supposed to be the Jewish homeland and gave it to their friends, their Hashemites, the Hashemites, who created the Hashemite kingdom there, the kingdom of Jordan. But in the end, it's just a Palestinian state. It's 70 or 80 percent Palestinian. Uh, the, the recent king married a Palestinian woman. So that's, that's the name they call themselves, uh, of local Arabs. And the bottom line is that there already is a two-state solution. There was a chunk of Jewish land given away to the Arabs. There's local Arabs, so-called Palestinian living there. And so that should be the two-state solution should be done with. Uh, and here's their state uh, cut away from the Jewish land. And what, what Mark Levin is saying here very quickly, but it's so important, like, let's be real. There already is that, that you guys want a two-state solution, accept it. And let's give Arabs rights there. Uh, uh, they can move there, live there, or they could stay in Israel as residents and be citizens in Jordan. There's many, many options, but like recognize the reality that's already on the ground instead of pushing for, for a hard reality, which is unacceptable, which is to give away the heartland of the Jewish state the high ground of the Jewish state, give it away to the enemy, have them rain rockets and, and destruction from there onto Jerusalem and onto Tel Aviv. It's simply an impossibility. And that's exactly what the Biden administration is pushing for. He's not going to listen to me. He's not going to listen to you folks. He's not going to listen to anybody except the radicals who are pushing this agenda. And many of them, just so people understand, are from the Obama administration. Mark Doeg to explain to the world what the problem is with the American government and the Israel relationship, and not only that, how the American government works behind the scenes to further the relationship with the terror countries. So you're fighting a two-war front now, a two-front war. You've got the usual terrorists and terrorist countries, and you have American diplomacy. Ouch. Okay, so uh, Mark Levin is equating jihadism with American diplomacy but I think it's fair because American diplomacy is pushing towards uh, a detente, giving a surrender to the jihad. You realize that if American diplomacy wins out, Hamas is going to declare a giant victory here, right? Because look, we created the atmosphere that would create a recognition of a Palestinian state. What a win uh, for Hamas. But just hear those words. Mark Levin is saying we have a two front war against jihadism and against a partner which is American diplomacy. That is just so awful. That is just so awful and, and really so hard to, to battle. Um, and and the, the reality that the land wants to be, that, that they're trying to get us to give our land away, there's a paradigm here, which is a, a, something that Jeremy Gimpel explained to me. The paradigm is, oh, we don't give it away to the jihadists, we give it through American intervention, then it goes to the jihadists, right? It's like a little bit of a trick. And so that's something that has to be watched out for. It's exactly what's being pushed on right now. You actually have Blinken coming to the Middle East, trying to organize the Arab countries against Israel. He's organizing Europe against Israel. He's organizing an effort to unilaterally represent or push for a Palestinian state. The fact of the matter is, you have a huge enemy in Joe Biden, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Thomas Friedman, uh, and the Democrat Party, which has moved more and more and more to its Islamist wing of Talib, Omar, AOC, and the other reprobate. Okay, so Mark Levin is saying that the allies is not Israel and the United States. It's not the so-called West. 
it's actually the progressives with the jihadis, so-called jihad squad in the uh, in the Congress, and that's the ideology that the Democrat Party is is going towards, and these guys are pushing that agenda. And so he's really saying, and this is an American, he's an American, and he's saying like, wow, the American administration is an enemy of Israel because they're lined up with the wrong folks. And they're out there rallying Western Europe and other countries and the Arab states to go against Israel. And this is very much the opposite of the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords was an effort by the American president, Trump, to try to bridge a relationship between Israel and its local neighbors, the Arab neighbors, with the UAE, with Morocco, with Sudan, uh, with Bahrain, and, and bridging, creating a, a new paradigm that actually Israel is an ally of regional Arabs. We are a similar people. We have one joint shared father, Abraham. We have a similar genetic code, similar religion, similar language, and we would do better to get over the 100-year war. But the Biden administration is pushing for jihadism to continue its march against Israel and to continue the path of the last hundred years, which has been so destructive. Israel's war crimes, are they investigating Hamas's war crimes, Islamic Jihad's war crimes, the Muslim Brotherhood's war crimes, Abbas's war crimes, Syria's war crimes, Jordan's war crimes? Are you kidding me? Is this what a friend does to an ally in the middle of a war? Biden protects Palestinian immigrants in the U.S. from deportation. Okay, so another very important point, which is the blood libel that's out there right now. The big blood libel is that Israel is committing war crimes. And, and just like he said, are you kidding me? It's like it's exactly the opposite. Israel is a victim of, of, of a jihadist onslaught. Really, it's a victim of the last hundred years of aggression. Uh, and now we were the victim of the October 7th massacre, and they would have done more. And, and had Hezbollah joined in, who knows what would have happened here. That's war crimes. But the trick of the progressive jihadist alliance is that the minute we go strong against the jihad, they go into progressive mode. And into instead of jihad mode, they go into progressive mode, which is war crimes, human rights. we got to protect the people, the civilians. Look at the civilian population. And, and their, their trick is, is that they go hard on Israel with jihad, and then they go soft when you attack them back and be like, look, we're victims. How could you do such a thing? And so that is a trick. And sadly, uh, the, uh, the American administration, uh, and now he's going to talk about the Israelis, are in co- some, some Israelis who are in cahoots with that plan to link up progressivism and jihadism and to shrink and destroy Israel. When you have a guy like Ehud Barak, a failed former prime minister who's detested by the vast majority of the Israeli people, going all around the United States and Europe, acting like he's the rational, moderate, peacemaker spokesman for the Israeli people, where he spends 90% of every interview really smearing your prime minister in the most horrific ways. When you have guys like Lapid, as weak as they get. The American government wants him as your prime minister because they know they can roll him at every turn. You have guys like Bennett, who basically, I'm just going to be honest, kind of a chameleon. He'll take whatever side he needs to take to become prime minister. But you have this, these three stooges and others saying what they say outside the United States, in Europe, published by Arab press, Palestinian press, by the, by the heinous elements of the American press, they are giving cover. They are giving support. And I want the Israeli people and those three to know, to the anti-Semites in the United States of America, to the Democrat Party in the United States of America, their war on Netanyahu is a war on Israel. Do you think the White House is dealing with Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid behind the scenes to prepare for the day after Netanyahu? Why are they dealing with Lapid and Gantz? Is because that's who they want. And so I'd say to the people of Israel, if Joe Biden wants Lapid or Gantz, uh, you better open your eyes very, very wide. You know, Gantz looks like a Hollywood figure. He's a former general, good looking guy, walks like John Wayne, but he's not John Wayne. He's not John Wayne. Lapid looks like what he used to look like. No offense, we're both on TV. He looks like a TV commentator. He's way over his head. These two guys could not lead Israel through this. You don't have, in my view, 
another known or significant leader, so-called in Israel, who could do what Netanyahu is doing. What do you think? Well, that's one of the dichotomies of, of Israel and Israeli leadership. And I think that this part of the interview is very candid and very honest. He's saying, look, Israel, you don't have good leaders. You want to, you want, you want to throw off Netanyahu, you want new leadership. Okay, but do you have somebody of this caliber to stand up against the jihadist world and the progressive world against the U.S. administration and European countries? Do you have somebody on that level? And that's also something that could be actually a critique against Netanyahu. Netanyahu, you should have trained already by now the next generation of leadership. You got to pass on the mantle. So you got to make sure that there's good people. But that's something that Netanyahu has not done. And so Israel is in a bit of a quandary. And we got to turn to God and say, Hashem, God Almighty, please help the Jewish people. Please help us have great leadership in order to lead this country forward, in order to fight off the bad guys for the next generations. So we definitely, I think that Mark Levin is very right, and he's pointing to a, a structural problem, a strategic problem that we have here in Israel, is that we don't have the next generation of great leaders. Think about the eight plan that the Senate wants to pass. The Republicans know they can't pass it this way. Okay, so they break it out and say, okay, just funding for Israel. So Biden says, no, I want all the rest of it. Israel's just a piece of it. And by the way, a small piece of it. So 14 billion, 17 billion for Israel, that's not even a grain of sand in the Sahara. It's so ridiculous. Okay, so here the point is about uh, American aid and really $17 billion is very little if you think about that they're giving to Ukraine $50 billion to rearm and fight Russia in, a, in you know what could be considered almost a useless war and a useless loss of life. Here we're defending ourselves. Uh, but okay, I'm not here to comment on the Ukraine thing, but he's trying to say $17 billion is small compared to $50, $50 billion that has been given for just six months. With all that, uh, here is where I would say Israel actually could use less aid uh, less of, of what I call a joint development funding because, because we need to be uh, more independent. And I think this war has shown us, and I think that Obama and Biden both shown us that Israel has to produce its own armament. Israel's got to be more independent in every way possible, energy independence, food independence, uh, 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 military equipment independence, uh, and diversified because we need to be able to not, we need to not be a, a, at a strategic stranglehold by a force that may come in. Who knows who the next American president is? We could see what's happening right now. We can't have that. And it's not good for us. It's not good for Israel. Israel needs independence. And so here, I think that in some ways, in the short term, it might hurt to not get uh, American aid. I think in the long term, that's the correct thing. That's what Israel needs. Israel needs more independence uh, to protect itself, to defend itself. And it's also for its own spiritual, emotional health. We need to kind of grow up. We need to be our own country and stand on our own two feet totally. Thomas Friedman, how much damage does he do? Why would Thomas Friedman work for the New York Times? Because he's a self-hater, that's why. And the things that he writes has influenced in the Biden administration and the Democrat Party, even though I find his columns to barely be literate, quite frankly. A guy who sits on his ass in his office at the Holocaust-denying New York Times, sitting there deciding what the Middle East should look like. Well, who voted for him? Who elected him? Nobody. Okay, so, uh, you know, I got a chance to meet Thomas Friedman. I even got a chance to tour him here in Hebron. Uh, and I think Mark Levin is right in the sense that here are these guys that really don't understand the Middle East at all because they don't understand three things about the Middle East. They don't understand religion. They don't understand God. They don't understand Middle East honor. And they don't understand deterrence. They don't understand that this is a religious region and that religion matters and history of religion matters. They don't understand that the way that you get honor in the Middle East is by giving honor. And when you give honor, you get honor. And when you demand honor, you get honor. And if you're not honorable, if you don't hold on to your land and your, your religious sites and, and, and stand up for what's right and hold the line, then people disrespect you. They, they, they just think of you as, as, as nothing. They dishonor you because you are, because you are lowly, because you're not, you don't stand up for God and you don't stand up for your own honor your own honor. And they and this these people like Thomas Friedman don't understand the third thing, which is deterrence. They don't understand that you got to smash the bad guys around here. And then people respect you. That's the way to move forward and not to uh, and not to succumb to their you know whims and negotiate with them. You got to crush them because they want to crush you. And when you crush them, everybody around says, 
that's a serious country. That's a country that we can work with because they're serious in defending themselves. They have honor. They have God with them. If you can't talk that way, if you don't understand that kind of lingo, then you actually don't understand how to get things done around here, and you don't understand how to get to real peace, which is through strength, through honor, and through God. What do you think will happen in the U.S. election in November? Well, I'm not Nostradamus. I'll give it a shot. I hope Trump wins, but they're trying to put him in prison. That's the problem with the Marxist left. That's what they do. So uh, he's fighting that. But that said, I think Trump will win ultimately. I pray to God. Well, I can't comment so much about American politics uh, because I think that my job here is to stand up for Israel and the Jewish state and the interests of the, Jew in interests of the Jewish state. And I said before that we need more independence from even actors, even allies like America. At the same time, I think that President Trump does not get enough credit, not just for being pro-Israel, but for moving the ball on what pro-Israelism is. Pro-Israelism pro is standing up to the jihad and their assistance at the UN, UNRWA, UNESCO, all these arms, the International Court of Justice, push back against those guys and say, hey, get your hands off of Israel. We need Israel to be successful. We need it to be a channel for blessings. We don't need the world to be taken over by the jihad, which is like a black blanket of like doom over everybody and like suppression of the mind. Uh, it's the great suppression of the global mind is the jihad. We need Israel to thrive and be alive and have freedom uh, and, and be successful. And the local peoples around here, the Arabs, will benefit from a pushback on the jihad. If Israel's successful, this whole region is going to flourish. And I think President Trump understood that. He understood who the real enemies are, the media and the campus and the international organizations. And he recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, which is the spiritual capital uh, of the world and the right to the Golan Heights and the rights of Jews uh, to uh, live in Judea and Samaria. And this current administration is doing everything to undermine those values. The vast majority of the American people stand with Israel. It doesn't matter what they march in New York or march in LA or march in Washington, D.C. There's a big America out there from sea to shining sea. And all the people in the middle, I dare say 80 to 90 percent, they're not talking river to the sea. They're not talking like this at all. They're not marching in the streets about obliterating the Jews or anything like this. They are pro-Israel, the vast majority of America. Mark Levine, thank you so much. I think it's important to say that, that I, I, I believe that the world is like that. I think America has more pro-Israel sentiment than maybe some other countries. There are many others that can be allied with Israel. There is a global movement of nationalism, post and anti-jihadism, family values, biblical values. There is an access of people around the world that want these things. They're in Argentina and they're in the Czech Republic and in Hungary and in Poland and in India. There's many people around the world that want to push back on the jihad, have classical conservative values, uh, uh, give opportunities and freedoms to people, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of movement. Um, and they want the Bible to come to life and they want Israel to thrive. Israel is a force of good in this world, of godly good. Uh, and there are forces who want darkness in this world. And those are the forces that you can tell who they are. They're aligned with the jihad. They're aligned with progressive values, which undermine the, the, the image of God in this world, uh, undermine the family, undermine the Bible. And uh, those are values that are dear to millions and millions of Americans and millions and millions of people around the world. Much for this interview, much appreciated. We love you here in Israel and we hope to see you in Israel as soon as possible. Take care. God bless you. We thank you very, very much. All right, so that was Mark Levin uh, here on Israel's Channel 14, a very important interview that really covered uh, uh, so many points, including the blood libel against Israel, uh, of, of the war crimes blood libel, the danger of the two-state solution, uh, the Jordan is so-called Palestine, uh, and many other important points that are important. God bless you from Hebron. Well, thank me very much. That was very good. <laughs> okay, that was great. I just um, want to tell everybody, you know, when you guys watch videos on YouTube, so you have to make thumbnails. The thumbnail is that little picture that goes with a video. So in order to make that, you have to take pictures of yourself, different pictures, and you use them inside the, 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 the thumbnail. So uh, Isha and I were talking about, Isha, you and I were talking about how 
um, we need to come up with like more reaction video pictures, you know, right. so that we can create like there's could be more diversity of emotion in your in your thumbnails. Right. And we were like, how can we figure out which emotions you need to put in your thumbnails? And then we realized that we're just going to go down the list of emojis and just take every emoji. Oh, we're going to do an emoji roll. I'm yeah. excited about that. Maka, speaking of uh, emoji rolls, I have no way to connect it to anything else. But speaking of emoji rolls, well, an emoji is a emoji is a representation of yeah. a person. Okay. Of a person's face and a person's reactions and feelings. It's actually, if you think about it, it's really quite brilliant. The face represents an emotion. Mm. And the emoji represents a face that represents an emoji. So therefore, that's my face that I'm sending to you. Right. It's very interesting. It's actually biblical. Like, I'm sending you my face. Hmm. God sends his face to you. And I've shown you that actually there is the original emoji uh, is in the Torah when it talks about the three blessings, the tripartite blessings of the priests. Uh, it says, uh, the, Rashi explains that when it says God shall shine his face upon you, he, he, Rashi says it'll be a yellow face, a smiling face. And that is the original emoji. When God sends you his smiling face, that's a, that's a blessing in your life. When I see emojis a lot of times and I see somebody wearing an emoji keeper or something, I'm like, ding. That's a little blessing. That's a little message from God. Another image of the human being is kind of the ultimate human being, and that is the Kohen Gadol. And this week's Torah portion is the vestments, the way that he's dressed. I think we should all have a picture of the Kohen Gadol in our house. Hmm. We don't have one no. here either. I would like that. Well, that's your first time saying that out loud to me. Well, So I didn't prepare that. One of the things that I, I, yeah. I, I'm... I'm, You're creating your thoughts. I'm creating right my now. thoughts, and, yeah. and and I I I have an, I have a realization, just like you're supposed to really have a picture of the Beit Hamikdash in your house, right? You're supposed and 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 I was just in the house yesterday, and it's such an excellent picture of the Beit Hamikdash. Did you take was, a picture? Yes, and I was instantly jealous. I just took it. I just took the picture. I just took their yeah. picture off the wall. I'm like I'm like I need this need holiness in this my picture. house, not yeah. you. No, no. Uh, but I, I did see a beautiful. I was like that. That is the picture. The picture was not just of the temple, but of people coming to the temple. Yeah. So too, a person should have a picture of the Kohen Gadol. I say this specifically also to my non-Jewish brothers and really? sisters. You need to have a picture of that holy man, the Kohen Gadol, in Yerushalayim, praying for you and for the nations. That that is a piece of health for everybody. That okay. sounds that sounds a little dangerously like having other pictures in your house. No, no, no. It doesn't have to be like an actual representation of the face or something like that. But you should see the vessels and the ve the, the the vestments. You should see the coin good all in your mind. That's why the Torah is drawing it for us. It's drawing to us what is this ultimate servant of Hashem look like, and when we see the coin gadol. There's even a whole song that we sing on Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. There's a, the Kohen Gadol represents the Memsad. How do I say Memsad? The, um, as opposed to Moses, which is a one-off human being whose face was lit on, on, and he was just a unique person. The Kohen Gadol is the representation of how God gives himself over, that we connect to God and God gives himself over to humanity, okay? And so we should have that. I also recommend that people have a picture of the Kodesh Kodeshim, the, the Ark of the Covenant and the, and, the, and, the, and the Ark itself and the cherubs or have one of these little things. Like have that in your mind. You have that in your house. You will be like God speaks to, 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 to the Jewish people, to mankind, through Yerushalayim. That's where there's a holy place. I want people to have in their house the thing that reminds them that there is in Yerushalayim a place that they're supposed to turn to and connect to God. In this week's Torah, last week's Torah portion, it says that God speaks to us bet between the, the cherub's wings, basically, right. at any equidistant point. So to the Kohen Gadol. A coin, the, the image of, and I use in my mind sometimes the image of the Kohen Gadol to meditate on. And this week's Torah portion has the 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 breastplate and the and the head plate and the and 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 the whole look of the Kohen Gadol, and when you focus on that, that is a way to channel like what humanity is supposed to be, what is the epicenter of humanity. I just want to uh, focus on one thing, 
is that when um, when you when the coin Gadol has a a a, 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 a fod, he's got this like what's it called? This kind of I don't know. They have a proper name for it in English. Not a tunic. Maybe it's a tunic, but uh, he's got at the very bottom of this uh, of his of the hem of this kind of skirt like thing. It's got pa'amon verimon. It's got a bell and, and the pomegranate. Ball. Yeah, bell and a pomegranate. Yeah. And that's and it has this great and says vasital shulav you make on the bottom of this of this of this uh, skirt like thing you make a pa'amon and rimon vasital shulav rimonei tchelet there'll be rimonim of tchelet vargaman v'tolat shani al shulav it will have uh, uh, it'll have um, red crimson and uh, and um, and the the purple cloth uh, on its uh, on its hem. Saviv, Pamone Zahav Betocham. One second, where's the person? Oh, Pamon Zahav Verimon. Pamon Zahav Verimon. A, a, it says it twice. It says a, a little bell, a little bell, and a uh, pomegranate. I just want to say, a bell and a pomegranate are kind of the opposites. A bell ding, ding, dings, and lets you know that, that you're coming and that there's a, there's a voice that's, that's coming out from you and God, and then God also knows that you're coming into the Holy of Holies, the, 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 the high priest. But then there's also a Ramon. You know, Ramon is exactly the opposite. It's totally a hidden fruit. Right. It's totally... Uh, right, there's uh, to- so many little secrets inside. Right. It's got secrets inside. So the bell is like, here's who I am. I announce. It announces it. And the Ramon is like, no, I, I am all inside. You'll never nice, know. And nice, I have nice. endless secrets. And that's a very big truth about humanity. There's a way that we serve God together in joy and in big festivals and public events and we pray together. And then there's something that's inside that's our only, you know, our personal connection to God. And God is the same way. There's certain things that he reveals to everybody and then there's certain things that he reveals just to you. And then there are many things he doesn't reveal to anybody. And we'll never really know. And I just think that the Kohen Gadol, that image of the Pa'amon and Rimon, that's, that's a way to... Uh, to to live life, we have to we have to reveal and, and talk and be loud, and then also keep that inner part strong, and and keep our you know secrets and talk to God directly and just have a personal relationship with God. All right, Maka, uh, do we have anybody else that we have to uh, thank uh, for the show? I feel like well, I, I definitely want to thank the people who are buying us a coffee. I, I mentioned that I mentioned the coffee buy me a coffee dot com. That I'm, makes such the difference. Oh, speaking Isha, of Isha, you just used a little piece of equipment today. And recording your, uh, recording your interview with CBS. Yes, that's right. That was that was made possible due to the help of people who buy us a coffee. One thousand percent. One thousand percent. So thank you to all those good folks. Thanks also to JewishPress.com uh, for putting up our show uh, and, and all our partners there. Thanks to the Land of Israel Network, and thank you, of course, to Yochevet Seidman, Moshe Herman, Ben Bresky, Tabitha, and Lou. And we're live. Best team uh, ever. Wonderful Dove team. It. And do, and the big do that's yeah. right the big dovid he makes he makes he makes a big contribution to the team of getting out uh, the voice getting out the voice and as much voice as I give out and I give out a lot there's things that you can't give out that's only for your house only for your home only for your you know your wife and only for for your own, your own self and only for your talking with God that's what I mean by have very there right. are things we 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 broadcast and yet there's certain things that are that are private both of those are true even for the Kohen Gadol. God bless you folks wherever you are. Thank you very much, Malka. You are wonderful and awesome. May Hashem give speedy recovery to the people injured. May He avenge the blood of those who have fallen. And may He protect our soldiers and our nation and channel. Bring back our hostages. Amen. And bring back the hostages and channel the light of God in this world through Jerusalem now to the universe. God bless you folks wherever you are. Lots of love and shalom.